definitely we are into a market that is going to be probably more stable for copper and the fundamentals uh, are there. Welcome viewers to another one-to-one -one Mining Investment Americas Commodities Analysis. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Francisco Acuna, who's the Senior Consultant for Basin Battery Metals at CRU. Francisco has a broad career advising on geometallurgy, project development, mine acquisitions, deal structuring, project finance across a wide spectrum of mining companies. He's also led business development roles at Kura Minerals and uh, also previously worked with uh, BHP in the company's copper group. So we're very well placed and in good hands to hear all about the copper market. Um, so thanks for joining me, Francisco, and um, I'll hand over to you to take us through some of the copper market highlights. Hi, Adam. Well, thanks for the, the kind introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this new edition of the one-to-one -one conference. Uh, well, so I will start sharing my screen to go over some of the cover highlights, as you, as you just mentioned. So um, a little bit on the agenda that um, we're planning to cover today, the, the first part, which is going to be the copper market highlights, uh, is going to be more of a structure as a presentation, and then I hope that uh, we can have more of a Q&A conversation on a couple of topics that are becoming quite uh, trendy among investors and, uh, and everybody across the mining sector. So starting with the copper market uh, highlights, I will um, change a little bit the structure here to how we normally show things. I will start by the end which is the price, which I think it's something that investors are always uh, worried about and something they want to see and actually what drives uh, mining investment. Uh, so this year has been a roller coaster, I think, uh, for everybody and uh, in every sort of aspect with the coronavirus hitting, hitting the world and the, the, the pandemic situation and the economic downturn as a result of it has uh, had a major impact across commodities, across markets. So here in the graph on the left, uh, we can see a bit of a quarter by quarter, what is the uh, cover price and how we're estimating it will end on this fourth quarter, around uh, $3 per pound of, uh, of copper, which is uh, the main issue here we had in uh, the first two quarters uh, with prices going deeply down, uh, which affected both uh, producers and new investors and new, and new projects as well. Um, but however, we saw a quick recovery and we're going to see why that happened and little, what are the drivers behind that recovery. And most importantly, how are we seeing copper from now on uh, moving forward in the next five years? Uh, so we see, as you see on the, on the graph on the right, uh, quite an interesting recovery for 2021. So we're pretty uh, positive on the outlook for copper price on 2021. Then on 2022, a bit of a correction, and then uh, continuing with an increasing uh, uh, copper price up to 2025. So in, in an overall picture, I think uh, obviously we still keep some low and high cases, and then we're going to see a little bit what, what drives those. Uh, but we are overall positive on what is the outlook for, for copper price, uh, which obviously is a good incentive for both minor mining operations and also as well for new projects coming in line. Um, so a little bit what had happened with the copper demand, which obviously uh, to make sort of a parallel comparison with, with gold or silver and uh, with precious metals where um, they, they gain, the, copper is mainly driven by fundamentals uh, of market. So basically supply and demand, not much about sentiment uh, as you can, can see in gold, for instance. Uh, so what we have to see is really what had happened with the demand and then we'll see, we'll go over the supply. When we talk copper, we have to talk about China. Uh, China is uh, the number one consumer of, of copper by far. And uh, how we see here on the, on the, on the left side, um, global refined copper consumption. Well, we see China and rest of the world. What has happened this, this year? And uh, actually now we are, uh, we started the year thinking that the coronavirus effect was not going to be that deep. Uh, then, on the second quarter, when this was a global effect, we thought, okay, this is going to be a major impact. However, China recovered almost spectacularly in terms of copper demand. And as you see on the left, at the end of the, of the year, we expect to have an overall growth in copper consumption in, in China. 
Uh, not so much in the rest of the world when you see a decline of 8.9% uh, 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 decrease in, in, in global, in, in the rest of the world, global refined copper consumption. And that leaves us with an overall decreasing 3.3% uh, on the total uh, refined copper consumption at a global level. And then we see a, a quick recovery in 2021 uh, and moving forward as well in the next five years. So to give you an idea of this and what I was saying before and how our perception changed across the, the, the year, it's uh, on, on the right side, you see by at the beginning of the year, our forecast for the next five years, uh, you see it on light blue, um, change uh, quite dramatically. And then in April, we had a very bullish, I mean, sorry, bearish uh, concept on what would be the actual demand for this year, but actually it got corrected on the second half of the year. And now by October, we see a decrease of 1.3 million tons of uh, actual refined copper consumption decrease this year. Now moving forward, like uh, despite we're going to have a, a recovery in copper consumption, we think that still there will be a gap of uh, actual consumption that got lost uh, uh, in comparison to pre-COVID uh, forecast. Um, however, if you, if you separate things, China will still be uh, almost back to pre-COVID levels by 2025. However, the rest of the world will be, will be below that. Um, a couple of comments on the China recovery and, and why it sort of took us everybody by surprise. So on one hand, and, and this is also as being on a, on a macro level, so a couple of things also that have uh, pushed the copper price up is the fiscal uh, stimulus that we've seen across um, major economies uh, that obviously drive uh, infrastructure expenditure and, and, and durable goods exp uh, buying as well. So all of that has a, a good, it's, it's, it's good for the copper price, which is, um, However, on, a, on another hand, uh, you have um, the, the US dollar that depreciated uh, and that also caused, um, sort of artificially creates that uh, a copper price goes up because even when copper is, uh, is traded in US dollars, major consumption comes from China. So that uh, change in the uh, US dollar currency uh, have an impact obviously in copper price. So, but going back to China here, what we see is uh, it's about the fiscal stimulus that uh, initially on the first half of the year when the stimulus was presented, it was giving the idea that uh, it was not going to be that heavy in infrastructure expenditure and the old school sort of uh, stimulus that goes into heavy in fiscal and it was going to be more into promoting consumer consumption. However, as we see here at the end of the day, uh, this actual stimulus showed to be very much into infrastructure, into construction, into electric grids. So if you compare it with the um, uh, GFC um, stimulus, it's actually only 10% less in terms of uh, uh, real nominal uh, yuan. Uh, so basically we're seeing that uh, there is strong stimulus uh, towards copper consumption. So obviously that's good for this whole Chinese story of uh, uh, copper consumption. And uh, on the other hand, another aspect uh, that, that we are looking at is that the import of copper to China has been increasing uh, almost at uh, unseen levels. And, uh, but however, this doesn't reflect into real consumption. So what I mean by this is when you look at uh, all the imports of copper and then the export or how actual copper is used within China, uh, there is a huge gap so there's a lot of copper that's being imported and has been uh, stocked somewhere. So it can be assumed that the, the Federal Reserve of China is importing and, and stockpiling copper somewhere, but it's um, somehow a bit of a, of a black box, if you don't call it that way, because when you look as, at um, transparent stocks, you see that there is a, a decrease in, in copper stocks, which has also been positive for the copper price, but in China particularly, it's a bit more obscure to really understand how, how what is the dynamic and why that those imports are increasing so much has uh, created a, an import spree that it might come to an end, but, uh, but in general terms, it really helped copper to recover very, very quickly. Uh, now, what would happen with uh, copper consumption? Um, we did mention as, as, as Copper consumption will recover, we already saw that, but 
if we take a look a little bit on the some demand scenarios in case of uh, what will happen with COVID, will there be a second wave or maybe we'll have a faster recovery? Here in these graphs, uh, which is uh, we're showing sort of the same, it's, it's basically uh, growth rate or change year by year of uh, refined copper consumption uh, on a global scale uh, with a different time time frames. So basically what we're seeing is that the base case in blue that we already saw a little bit on how that recovery is coming primarily starting next year and then uh, continue certain growth, uh, the risk is still to the downside uh, in case of if there is a COVID second wave or, or third waves and so on, uh, where we can see even a, a quite a dramatic drop in copper demand, which obviously will have a huge impact in copper price by next year. Uh, on the bright side, so the bright side is not as, as, as um, you don't see that much of a difference. Uh, on, on the best case scenario on the upside is that we have faster recovery in copper consumption. Uh, we'll go back to uh, pre-COVID levels by 2022, obviously, which is good as well for, for price and for mine operations, etc. However, still the risk of uh, uncertainties around COVID are more towards the, the downside. Um, now switching a little bit to the supply side, because on one hand, as we saw, what's being supporting the price is obviously some macroeconomic aspects, uh, but also increasing demand, particularly in China, uh, and uh, overall recovery starting next year, both in China and in the rest of the world. Uh, in terms of supply, on the other hand, um, there was a, a lot of risk and uh, disruptions that happened due to the pandemic situation. Uh, here in this graph, you see up to July a little bit how we were tracking the impact in, uh, in mine-related uh, cutbacks um, across the globe. So within mine disruptions and mine cutbacks, uh, we saw that a significant amount of uh, cover production was lost. So, and, uh, and if you go here, when we look at country by country, this predominantly happened in Peru and, uh, and second level Chile as well. However, uh, so all of this put pressure as well on the copper price because as demand started to recover quite quickly, Peru and Chile and USA, which were the countries, the copper producers that were more affected by, by COVID, they are all in the West Hemisphere where COVID hit uh, afterwards. So as, as the East was recovering, uh, we were having mine disruptions on the West and obviously that created some sort of unbalance some, and a risk premium over, over copper. Um, a little bit on, on, on Peru. Peru has been uh, recovering pretty much to pre-COVID uh, levels. In the case of Chile, it was a bit different. There were no actual um, mine disruptions in the sense that uh, any mines had to really stop, but many uh, mining plants changed and the production guidelines uh, were revised downwards. So um, there was still a loss in, in, in copper production. So now we're looking at that um, this time of the year, we're already seeing that uh, copper producers are getting back to normal levels, to pre-COVID levels. Uh, so that also will balance a little bit the, um, the copper price as the supply will start catching up with this actual demand and this risk premium probably will start uh, to lose traction. Um, <clears throat> now, having said all, all of this, um, it's been overall uh, uh, quite a crazy year for mining producers. As we see on the left, as I was just saying, the uh, global copper mine production will go coming back to normal and we'll see a 3.6% increase by next year, uh, which is pretty good. And uh, we estimate that the overall uh, loss uh, in mine production this year is going to be 2.1. And again, as you see the different, sorry, as you see the different dot lines, uh, our forecast has changed quite a bit. So the light sort of yellow uh, is the, the forecast in January this year, so which was pretty positive. And then how in April we were very bearish because we still a lot of uncertainties. We didn't know what was going to happen, what was going to be the level of uh, pandemic, the infections in particular in Chile and Peru. And then that started to to change a little bit in time and everything now, every mine operations has put in place uh, different protocols to keep up production uh, as much as possible. Uh, it's being an overall, you see on the right hand side, uh, obviously as the copper price hit the bottom in March, April, 
um, many miners were losing money. Uh, but uh, since copper price is starting to get up, you see that very healthy margin for copper producers. Uh, what we're looking there at the right are the um, different um, cash cost percentiles. So basically, the light blue, the 90th percentiles, means that uh, um, a lot of that's usually the threshold where at least 10% of the companies are losing money. Uh, that is sort of the threshold we usually see to see how healthy the, the, the margins are for, for copper producers. So very healthy margins for copper producers nowadays. So that's good. And, uh, and production is coming up in line. So they're taking advantage of these uh, higher copper prices. And not only copper prices, because remember that uh, many of the mine operations, particularly the one produces concentrates, uh, do have credits for gold and silver, uh, which have been obviously uh, doing very well uh, as well. So overall, very good uh, year nowadays for copper producers, though that means that they will have cash at hand for uh, years to come. <clears throat> now, um, even though as, uh, as we saw earlier, uh, copper demand is, is going up um, quite strongly at, at a global scale, and particularly in China, uh, we still think that uh, copper prices will pick up in 2021 and then they will correct a little bit by 2022. And the reason for that is that there is significant uh, ramp up of large scales coming online. So many projects were delayed. Um, however, a lot of projects are coming online uh, and major projects. So in both in Chile, Peru, also Camoa, you have them in, in DRC. That is, uh, that actually was the only project that according to our guidelines moved uh, forward. All of the other ones were sort of delayed through the, uh, due to the coronavirus situation. So many projects both in Chile and Peru coming online, expense so far is in Chile, QB2, Ethenient Expansion. Um, then you have Keyaveco that finally is coming, coming online, for instance, in, in Peru, Minajusta as well. So overall, many committed projects already being built, uh, and we're talking about major projects. Uh, producing over a hundred thousand tons per year of, uh, of copper. Now, not only major projects are coming online, also uh, tier two projects uh, operations are coming online. Uh, Lone Star in the U.S. in the U.S. Sorry, um, and so on. So the pipeline is quite um, uh, heavy. So in overall, we are pretty optimistic in that uh, these projects will provide sufficient supply to get the market in balance by next year. And maybe we'll see, start looking at surpluses of copper on 2023 to 2025. And only by 2025, we'll probably start seeing an, uh, a deficit of copper and when new projects will be required. But still, even though committed projects are coming online, there's still quite a few probable, possible, and speculative projects as well wandering around. So it's, uh, it's a good opportunity for projects to, to being developed as, as uh, nowadays, taking advantage of uh, higher copper prices and, uh, and good fundamentals in terms of copper demand. Uh, but the reality is that we'll have to wait to really see a deficit in the, in the copper market to 2025. Now, looking at um, thinking about more exploration and, and newer projects, uh, Possible and speculative projects uh, are going to be needed in the pipeline. And as we see here uh, uh, on the graph on the left, like I was saying before, 2025 onwards is when we see that uh, copper demand will actually require projects from, um, I mean, sorry, copper from projects uh, that are still on a, on a more speculative uh, environment. So here at the bottom with sort of our definitions for speculative projects, still all of them are in early feasibility stage uh, at least, well, except for speculative. So um, an opportunity definitely for projects to be ready uh, to come online by 2025 and, and onwards, or at least to have uh, approval for construction. Uh, looking at the more exploration side, I think uh, no, nothing, nothing too new. So uh, on one hand, majors have favored uh, brownfield explorations. But overall, as you see at the bottom, the exploration budgets when compared to 2014 have been, uh, with some exceptions, with, with Freeport lately, for instance, uh, most of them have been decreasing, going down. So not much exploration activity from the majors and 
exploration activity that they've done has been mostly towards brownfield expansions. And, and on the other hand, juniors have seen a, a struggle to really get finance in the past years uh, due to poor market conditions and, and, and uh, investors putting uh, their, their money elsewhere. So still an, an opportunity here for newer projects as uh, uh, cover demand increases and we'll start to see a tighter market by 2025 onwards. Um, and uh, in any case, the worst seems to have passed unless there's still a down, uh, downward risk on a COVID second wave. Uh, but overall, I think uh, we're going to keep uh, good uh, copper prices uh, in, the, in the short term and in the mid term as well. Adam, so that's a bit of a wrap up on the uh, on the copper highlights. Thank you very much, Francisco. Excellent stuff. Um, and that's a uh, very comprehensive and relatively short uh, time frame. Um, I just want to pick up on uh, something you were mentioning there at the end um, around uh, financing and juniors. Um, overall, it seems to me that the fundamentals are looking uh, pretty positive. Uh, you mentioned uh, price is looking uh, pretty uh, positive as well um, in the near to midterm. Um, do you think that, uh, you know, why have these juniors struggled to raise finance um, uh, so far? And also, do you think that those conditions could be turning um, with the market outlook that you've just um, summarized? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, well, um, on one hand, we've come from many years of uh, depressed cover prices. Uh, we did see some good, good cover prices in 2018 but it was uh, rather volatile. And, uh, and, and the other thing is, as I, I pointed out beforehand as well, that there's a lot of major projects coming online next year and the next two years. So that means that those projects were committed a couple of years back because construction takes quite some time. So we've been seeing that these uh, major projects have been built and or, or were already approved for construction uh, for a couple of years now. So it seems like the market didn't really appreciate the need for new projects. Uh, so that sort of pushed exploration activity down and access to capital wasn't really uh, available. And I, it, it was sort of an issue for the commodity sector as a whole uh, and base metals, particularly copper, which are more driven by fundamentals, make it even, even harder. And, and again, finding new quote unquote good copper projects is not that easy. You don't have too many greenfield projects wandering around. Um, but at the same time, brownfield expansion can get only up to a certain point. So now the footprint of, uh, let's say, older deposits is, is too huge. The environmental footprint is increasing. Their costs are increasing. So all of that make it more likely that uh, new projects might be needed uh, for the next uh, five years. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to find a good covered project. I think uh, you need to find investors that are willing to wait some time to get their return uh, because again it's it's cover usually is not that volatile and you 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 will not get these crazy prices appreciation uh, but uh, I think the fundamentals are there uh, very strong and therefore I think uh, that it is an opportunity well I'm, I I can't recommend on investments or anything like that but uh, uh, definitely we are into a market that is going to be probably more stable for copper and the fundamentals. Uh, are there and particularly driven by uh, uh, maybe a topic that we can we can talk afterwards as well is how EVs have changed as well a lot of this perception on, on, on the copper demand for for the future. Um, you just mentioned a lot um, about you know so much is depend on what China does um, and we know they've got a five-year plan coming up um, do you have uh, any expectations as to how infrastructurally focused that's going to be um, we knew, we've knew we known about the Belt and Road Initiative for a long time, for instance, and that's got many different agendas to it. Um, but if, if it's very much infrastructurally led, this is, this is all very uh, bullish um, uh, for, for copper, really. Yeah, yeah, no, you are uh, absolutely correct. Uh, and one thing, obviously, we are waiting for the five-year plan that is coming. And, uh, and also you have to look a little bit backwards on uh, what have, have been the actual result of the previous uh, five-year plans, right? Uh, and, and how actually the goals are actually achieved or not. So I, I think for the last one, we see around like 60 something percent of achievement of what they, 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 they actually were planning to. So that's obviously a very good uh, 
a very good uh, result. Uh, and, and I think China for a while now is, is, is changing their economy in the sense that uh, it's as, as, the, as the economy grows, uh, it tends to look more like uh, Europe and the US in the sense that uh, uh, obviously, uh, let's say, let's talk particularly about copper. Uh, copper consumption per capita will be increasing, right? Because the richest, uh, the richer the country is, you're able to buy more durable goods, more cars, more electronics, etc. So you as a person consume more copper, but that doesn't really trigger major copper consumption as a whole compared to actually infrastructure expenditure, which is more related to economies that are developing, right? So. China particularly was particularly crazy in terms of building cities, uh, building roads, uh, railroads, uh, electric grid, etc. So actually, that is what really pushing pushing copper consumption. I think on the shorter term, uh, the China will continue to be spending on infrastructure. I think it's uh, we thought originally with this stimulus after the coronavirus that it was going to be more consumer led. So how we get consumers to actually uh, buy more things and becoming more entrepreneurial, etc. But in reality, is that it, it shifts, it shifted more towards construction, electric grid, uh, machinery, etc. So uh, overall, I think on the short term, we're still going to see more of a traditional infrastructure expenditure from China. But in the mid to longer term, it, it was go it's going to switch to more of a, um, a consumer-led sort of a copper consumption. Yeah, that brings us nicely to the point around EVs, I suppose. Okay, we've got um, global energy transition going on. Um, obviously, the decarbonization movement is uh, very important for individuals, governments, um, for funds and uh, asset managers. Um, uh, China is a large consumer of yeah. automob automobiles and, and EVs. Um, their, their demand for EVs is set to grow. Um, how positive is this uh, then for copper and how much do you see of the copper market uh, being attributed to, to EV production um, further down the line? Yeah, so connecting that to the, the, to the previous point, actually, uh, one of the things that we're waiting for this five-year plan as well is that uh, a couple of weeks ago, China also made the announcement that they, they have a new goal to be carbon neutral by 2060, uh, which is uh, obviously a quite an ambitious plan. And, and, and we're still yet to see what is actually going to be the policy to take you there. So that's something that we're expecting to see in this five-year plan as well. Uh, but uh, I mean, without thinking too much, right? Again, to obviously this will be driven by uh, EVs on one hand, the use of renewable energy and uh, other things uh, on, on that line. So I think um, at the end of the day, it, did, it does help to this whole narrative of the green world, uh, probably to accelerate that narrative. And we're looking, we're seeing that across major economies, so in Europe particularly, all the fiscal stimulus that came as a result of uh, the coronavirus, all of them are favoring uh, investment in renewables, in EVs, very, very strongly. Uh, we're still waiting on what happens in the US. Uh, with the ele uh, election on one hand. So the fiscal stimulus being delayed potentially after, to after the election. Um, if um, Biden gets to win, he has promised that this new Green Deal, which probably will be, uh, have a huge impact as well on this uh, Green World narrative. And even despite if, if Trump gets reelected, I think uh, still the world is shifting that way, right? So it's not... Obviously, fiscal stimulus has a big uh, impact, but as well, I think consumers are changing, and, and also you have a like the Tesla announcement that they're planning to have the twenty-five thousand uh, dollar EV car uh, coming into the market. So uh, there will be a natural trend towards EVs. Um, so getting into specific numbers, uh, following your what you were just asking about the, and the role of cover in this whole story, um, I have a couple of slides prepared on that. So um, particularly, so copper is, uh, is one of the winners in the long term uh, of this EV revolution, and, and not just the EV revolution, but also this green green wall. As we see here on the on the left side, uh, nowadays uh, copper um, uh, only 1.8 percent of the share of the refined copper consumption is attributed to EVs, uh, cars, and infrastructure. 
um, probably you, you've heard the numbers before, but um, a, a, norm, uh, a normal car, so basically an EV uses a fully battery electric car, uses four times as much copper as a regular car. And in between you have hybrids and, and, and everything in the middle. And then you also have all the infrastructure requirements, uh, power stations, for instance, that can require, depending on the size, can, can need from two up to 100 kilos of copper. Um, so when you have all that taken into consideration and you see the when the EV penetration will happen, uh, we see that we started increasing the size of the copper market uh, on, on EVs will, can grow up to 16% by 2035. So in 15 years, we're looking that copper, uh, EVs will go from 1.8 of the market of the refined copper consumption up to 16%, which is huge. Uh, and actually, when you look at on the right-hand side of the, uh, the other graph, uh, we see that most of the growth of uh, cover consumption will come from EVs. And actually, if, it, if we will live in a world without EVs, uh, copper demand will probably stagnate by 2030. Um, but uh, like we see that big difference there is that EV is really pushing towards uh, uh, copper consumption. And uh, another interesting factor are renewables as well. That, as you see in this other graph as well, that the, the shift towards renewables, obviously there are more, more commodities as well that benefit from this, but particularly we're talking about cover, co copper, sorry. All these stimulus towards a greener world are also moving towards renewables. And uh, we see there how uh, the huge increase we're expecting over the next 30 years in terms of uh, install capacity of, uh, of wind and solar, uh, both uh, for the wind offshore and, and onshore. And when you translate that into copper consumption, uh, we see that in the next 10 years, there will be a, a, the amount of copper consumption so associated to renewables will double. And by 2050, uh, it will multiply almost by four. Uh, so keeping, keeping these this, this numbers in mind, uh, Again, are not huge today, and I want to go back to the previous to the previous graph. Only one percent of one point eight percent of the copper is used in EVs, but this will change both on the renewables and the EVs, and this this change uh, will will have a huge impact in, in copper. Um, obviously, the main the main driver here will be when this adoption to our, towards uh, EVs will happen. Um, most people think, and we think as well, that by 2025, or at least somewhere between this decade is when we'll see a major shift towards EVs, basically because, the, as I was saying before, the, uh, the actual prices of uh, EVs will come uh, in line with uh, traditional uh, fuels, fuel cars. And, uh, and if you put on top of that all the stimulus that we're seeing from China, from Europe, uh, and potentially in the US as well, uh, maybe this will be even fast tracking. So uh, some of the scenarios we were looking at is that uh, the the copper deficit by 2030 can increase up to 2 million tons of, of copper uh, deficit if the EV's narrative moves faster, like five years faster. So again, uh, we obviously we always have this long-term forecast, but if we see major changes in the next couple of years on EV pen EV's penetration, that will be an a immediate trigger to say, okay, copper demand and copper price will increase. So I think, again, going back to the investors, if you are somehow, um, let's say, bullish or want to participate in the EV revolution or EV-related investments, uh, copper uh, can be part of that. Yeah, certainly. Um, one sort of question playing devil's advocate here around this uh, penetration rate of EVs. Um, if we're going into sort of global recession, certainly in certain economies, and if we're experiencing um, fundamental changes in the way that cities operate, people live based around the global pandemic, um, even though EVs are cleaner than a combustion engine, they're still relatively more expensive. They're still perceived as a luxury item. Do you think the current challenges this year economically and in terms of the pandemic could delay that penetration a little bit for EVs? Well, I, I think in, in that point, that's where uh, actually all these uh, incentives and uh, um, fiscal stimulus that we're seeing in Europe are being extremely aggressive. I think in, uh, at 1.1 uh, 
car dealer in, in Germany, it was in Netherlands, I think. They were, at the other day, the car was pretty much for free when, when we, they put together all the different incentives and everything. So obviously that would play a role. Um, like you were saying, obviously the way everybody lives change, are changing things. Uh, for instance, in China, uh, overall car ownership are expected to plateau at a, at a certain level because people will start using car sharing and all of those things because cities will get just, just too big. So there is some changes on that, that maybe that there is a limit in the amount of uh, actual cars that people will own in the, in the longer run. But then the share of EVs will start going up and up in time. Um, another interesting factor is that when you when you you're talking about the uh, EVs being a luxury item, which is which is real, particularly in in the Western uh, hemisphere, uh, the Western world. However, in, in China, for many years, most of the EVs agenda has been towards cheaper cars that have yeah. low range, which obviously that's not attractive. But most of the market has been driven by uh, lower end uh, EVs in in China, and obviously that is that is changing uh, nowadays. But uh, the other thing that we're looking at, and when you see, I, I always use Tesla. I think Tesla is sort of a, an example to look at. Uh, if you look back to a couple of years ago, everybody was sort of talking about the range of a car, right? That's why EVs will never uh, penetrate because people want to have, uh, I don't know, uh, 500 kilometers or more of range. And that is too expensive, etc. But in reality, when you accommodate to different realities, maybe that's more of a reality in the U.S., uh, where people tend to drive uh, quite a bit. I, I lived there in the south south of the U.S. for a couple of years, and uh, I was surprised by the amount of driving that people did. Um, uh, way different in Europe, for instance. Uh, so it, it seems like now people are starting to care less about the, the, the range, maybe. Uh, so th that is something that we're trying to see in the market. So um, maybe more people will start switching towards uh, cheaper um, electric vehicles and also this whole electric vehicles are changing now Tesla has committed to a $25,000 car um, um, other manufacturers as well they're all Volkswagen I think they're in the 30,000s Nissan as well so I, I think we're starting to see uh, that uh, EVs will be more accessible to people I think this also the perception that range is so important maybe will not be as important and then, uh, and also when you complement that to an increasing uh, access to renewable energy, that will make the whole story even more, more green and more efficient. And also the, the cost of energy, how it decreases as well in time. All, all of those factors, it will combine and, and probably will make this, this transition happen uh, faster than, than we think. Yep, certainly. Yep, my next car is uh, an EV um, when it comes to making the purchase. Okay, um, yeah. so let's, let's look more on um, uh, the ESG themes then, segueing from the sort of environmental performance to how um, investors are certainly looking at um, ESG with heightened attention and heightened emphasis now. Um, and then also what, what are some of the companies doing? How are some of the companies performing? Um, because essentially copper mining um, could fit nicely into a, a, an impact-based portfolio or an ESG-aligned um, portfolio because of um, the, the way that it could green our society. But mining, of course, is inherently um, an extractive yeah. business. Um, so uh, how, come, how, how are you um, interpreting developments there? Yeah, no, that's, uh, I think your last point is key. I mean, uh, playing uh, the devil's advocate on my side now, I think. <laughs> When obviously we want to showcase and we want to see how we can uh, mining can be more ESG sustainable in, in, in across the board, um, you have always to remember that at the end of the day, mining is a very invasive uh, business. Like you said, it's a extractive industry, so it's very unlikely that we'll have zero uh, sort of uh, effect on 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 wherever it, it happens. Uh, now, as as the world moves towards a more greener uh, ESG compliant world and moving towards EVs and renewables, obviously that pressure also translates into mining, right? Because like you were pointing out, uh, people want to see, okay, copper will, uh, I need copper for my electric car because I, I want to uh, be my, decrease my carbon footprint, but where is that copper coming from, right? And, and so that pressure is moving across the supply chain and uh, mining companies are seeing more pressure than before, uh, particularly from the 
financial institutions or investors and, and actually how ESG compliant they are. Um, so in that regard, and uh, to my, my surprise, actually, in the last months, uh, this year, we've been looking at uh, working with clients uh, in major, let's say, transactional major projects, corporate projects, corporate assets. And uh, when normally ESG considerations have been always been relevant, but more from a uh, uh, license uh, to operate type of thing or more of a uh, sustainability approach, but a bit more vague, if you want to put it that way. Now there's definitely financial pressure uh, uh, on that. And investors are really asking about, okay, is this asset ESG compliant? Um, whatever that means, by the way. Uh, in order to move forward into a transaction. Um, so as, again, I'm going to um, share a, a, a couple slides with you on, on, on this theme uh, to complement this. Uh, so on one hand, uh, I think this is not too new. This is the results of uh, a, a survey that CRU did with the Fitch ratings uh, a couple months ago uh, in terms of understanding what are the major uh, ESG risks that the mining and metals and fertilizer industry are facing. Uh, the results from this survey were uh, across the board carbon emissions. Uh, so obviously that is, it, it's something that is picking up attention of uh, uh, mining companies across the globe because on one hand it's relatively easier to measure uh, compared to other ESG considerations and uh, something that uh, as different policies that we're going to take a look on that are, are changing is going to put more pressure on, uh, on, on the different mining uh, operations. Oh, sorry. I... Okay, I think I stopped sharing my screen, so I will fix that right away. Um, so in, in general, uh, so where we're seeing, or what will be the role in this case, if we talk about particularly about carbon emissions and how it will impact uh, mining projects and mining operations and the financing of projects, uh, I think there is a short, medium, and long-term effects. Uh, on the one hand, the short-term effect is basically what I was just talking about in, in access to capital, in, uh, which is going to be relevant for new projects and even for existing operation transaction uh, uh, among those. Uh, how financial institutions are favoring ESG compliant uh, investment and how the carbon footprint can actually be a measure to that. So uh, on, on the short term, we see that, that as a, a potential risk for projects. But then if you move in time, uh, in the mid time, if you want to put it that way, there will be a risk, an increasing risk in cost as well, associated to regulation around uh, carbon pricing. Uh, so carbon pricing is something that you're starting to see predominantly in Europe across different industries uh, as a means of, of achieving the Paris Agreement, uh, agreement goals. Uh, so in this sense, if uh, different carbon, emission, uh, carbon pricing schemes are put in different uh, jurisdictions, uh, you will see that carbon intensive mine operations will see an increase in their cost. And at the end of the day, mining, uh, it's, it's, it's a game of cost, right? So you want to be in the lower quartiles of, uh, of cost uh, of the industry, cost curve, uh, in order to be more profitable. So that's, uh, uh, we're starting to see that effect in the, in the midterm. And finally, uh, something that's still in its infancy, it's, uh, uh, it's around uh, the green, a green copper premium. So basically how consumer preference will change and maybe there will be a decommoditization, decommoditization if that word exists, uh, of, of copper and, and other metals as well. So will there be a premium for green copper? Uh, it is something that uh, the mechanism still yet to see how that will happen, uh, but it's definitely something that might have an impact in the in the longer term, and it will be a price differentiation among uh, copper producers in this sense. So um, I, I want to show you a couple of examples that I think are, are quite interesting in, in uh, because many times when you talk about ESG, it seems like people want to check a box and uh, and see if it's compliant or not. Uh, but a little bit on an approach on on, cop on carbon emissions. Uh, this is a simplified. Uh, diagram of the copper industry from the mining up to the smelting. Um, and uh, we selected scope one and scope two emissions. Uh, and, and we created, not created, but our approach was, okay, how can we measure 
uh, fuel and explosive emissions on one hand uh, and power generation both that we that each mining company can produce or that is purchased from the grid. So um, even though separately these are not the scope one and scope two, jointly are equivalent to scope one plus scope two emissions. Um, so that's a little bit the, the framework that we use to, to really measure uh, copper emissions. And to, to give you an example here, we use Chile as an example because um, for two reasons. One, obviously, is the number one copper producer on one hand, and the other is um, one of the countries that is shifting, shifting more rapidly, uh, copper producing countries that are shifting more uh, drastically to renewables. And, how, and we'll see how that actually have an impact in the uh, emissions. So what we're showing here is sort of an equivalent to a cost curve that you usually see for the for the industry. In this case, it's a, a carbon total uh, CO2 equivalent per ton of uh, copper uh, emissions. Uh, and, and what you see here is that as one will think, which is uh, kind of intuitive analysis, that underground and mixed operations are less carbon intensive in terms of fuel, uh, particularly because uh, most of the fuel consumption comes from the on the on the on the mine pit itself, and and underground operation have are less intensive in trucks and, and etc. And mining plan are more are more selective as well. Uh, and on the other hand, you have a kind of a big spectrum of mining operations. Even within Chile, uh, you can see that uh, even though the average is around one uh, one ton of uh, uh, CO2 equivalent per ton of, of produced copper. There is a uh, quite a difference between operations. You have some on the on the first quartiles, and then you have uh, other ones on the on the last quartiles. So obviously, that's where you have to keep an eye on. And this obviously reflects how it happens in different countries. And if you move forward and forecast to 2030, in this case, for instance, now we move to 2030. Um, it's a, the 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 change is a bit it's a bit fast, but you can see that many operations are mostly moving towards uh, the third and fourth quartiles and, and, and new projects coming online, which are highlighted in blue, are more on the first quartile. So, which again is a bit intuitive in the sense that older deposits that uh, are lower in gray uh, um, or to waste ratio are bigger. So the pit is, is bigger. So obviously it's more intensive in energy. Uh, but new projects are going to be more efficient because on the first years of operation, you usually have the higher grades, uh, the, 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 the pit size, if you want to put it in that way, smaller, etc. So again, you see a, a, how this curve shifts in time, which is, I think it's quite important. And obviously, thinking again in the investor's perspective, you want to be looking at projects that actually are uh, have a lesser carbon footprint. So an interesting metric to see for, uh, for investors. And, and finally, I don't want to get uh, uh, too long into this, but uh, when you put together the scope one and, and two emissions, so basically you're incorporating uh, the power generation and, and where is that coming from? Uh, if, you, if you look at the numbers in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, proportions, you see that uh, in terms of fuel emissions, uh, you have between one to two tons of, uh, uh, of CO2 per tons of copper. Now, when you add to that uh, the power emissions, these go up to five, six, seven. So what I'm saying here is that uh, uh, a key aspect of the uh, carbon footprint of a mining operation will be the source of the power they're using. Uh, so in this particular benchmark, uh, when we are comparing different mining operations across the globe, and we included some Chilean operations, uh, we're looking at while uh, on, by 2020, we estimate that uh, in terms of they are at similar level that other uh, operations in, in, in the world, uh, particularly that are powered with the coal-based uh, thermoelectric plants, there will be a huge drop in their emissions on the next five to 10 years. And this is due to new um, new uh, uh, contracts they've signed with power producers to be fully renewable. So go to from 60 to 100 percent of uh, renewable energy for the next five to uh, 10 years. And these are not just commitment; these are actual uh, actual uh, contracts happening. 
So this, again, will have a huge impact in uh, the carbon footprint of an asset. And if we go back to what uh, we were just discussing beforehand, uh, this will definitely have an impact in the economics of, a, of, a, of the project as um, the new regulation to carbon pricing having and, and, uh, and all of these changes. So again, investors, a couple of metrics that maybe investors will start to look at more is what is the actual carbon footprint of an asset and how you measure it and, and how you compare it uh, to the rest of the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're seeing that um, much more intensely now. Um, do you then consider that there's going to be some companies that execute this very well um, and then a big gap between those that perhaps struggle with the cost implications of doing this or, or making the adjustment to getting the levels of data that are required to do this accurately and to do it across all the parts of the value chain that you, um, that you highlighted before? And, and with that, do you see that sort of bifurcating the, the market a little bit in terms of the the companies that do ESG very well and the ones that don't, that could have an implication on um, where funds put their, put their capital as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and the thing is, uh, we'll, uh, particularly, as I said before, like since uh, power is, uh, or, or emissions associated to power generation are, are critical or, or basically are have the biggest proportion of the emissions, uh, many times that not necessarily depends only on the mining company or, or the mining projects. It will depend as well on the available infrastructure in the country, right? So as uh, countries that are favoring renewables and there is uh, uh, and, and there is the infrastructure associated to it that can actually transport. Because the thing with, with solar and wind, for instance, is that uh, it's not necessarily going to be right next to the mine operation, right? Because it's in order to generate solar and, and wind power, you need the specific conditions that might not be right next to your to your mine site, right? So in, in that case, you will need all the power grid infrastructure. So maybe you will have the generation many, many hundreds of kilometers away, but since you have the, 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 the grid infrastructure, you can, you can use that. So many projects uh, in the past that have a secure power uh, by building their own coal plants, for instance, uh, some examples can be uh, Cobre Panama or uh, Grassberg, for instance. Um, maybe those, those projects that are more isolated and are less likely to benefit from existing infrastructure to get access to renewables might have uh, more of, a, of an issue to really make this transition towards, towards renewables. And, and, and going back as well to your comment on what is going to be the cost difference, uh, I think uh, uh, obviously there is a quite a significant CapEx investment if you want to build everything from scratch. Uh, however, as I was highlighting before, maybe maybe that gap, that, let's say that CapEx gap, gap or that investment gap that you'll, you'll need more investment in order to be more ESG compliant, but as the financing uh, is, is, is getting more and more, um, the source of money is getting more you know, uh, looking in more detail about the ESG consideration, maybe the cost of capital will be different as well. And obviously, maybe this is too early to measure it, but uh, I think one way of looking at it is that the cost of capital will probably be higher for non-ESG compliant, uh, and, 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 and or, or yeah, not just the cost of capital, but the alternative of, of getting financing. Uh, and on the other hand, the ones that do, so maybe you'll have a bigger investment, higher capex, because you need to build let's say uh, a solar plant, just to, to say something. And uh, however, your capital will be cheaper because there will be more investors willing uh, to put money in the project because it is ESG compliant. So it's, 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 it's not black and white. I think uh, there will be a, a definitely a, a change on how people actually evaluate these projects. And I think cost of capital will be something uh, that might be, have an impact in, in, in projects moving ahead. Yeah, certainly. And mine is finding that balance. Um, okay, excellent. Um, so um, we're nearly at time, uh, but what I wanted to do was perhaps uh, wrap up with some of the key emerging risks um, that you see for copper mines, um, whether it's the majors down to the junior tier. Um, I know you do um, quite a lot of insights on um, some of the operational risks coming through, but also maybe some of the uh, sort of supply, chain, supply side challenges that you touched on earlier in your presentation, 
uh, geopolitical issues, um, maybe those as you'd highlight some of those as the top ones, but just give us your rundown on where you see some of the top risks um, for the mining companies um, in the near term. Yes, yeah, so uh, on the near term, so something that maybe I sort of skipped on the, on the initial highlights uh, because I was, I was trying to make it a bit uh, short. Um, so one of the risks, uh, so uh, like I said before, so uh, with the coronavirus, obviously there are many, um, some operations stop production, some other miners uh, change their guidelines and, and have new protocols in place to keep social distancing, etc. So um, many operations are working with less people than they used to work. So what all of this has meant that in order to, for them to keep up certain levels of production, and at the same time, take advantage of the higher copper price that we're seeing nowadays, uh, they, uh, what we saw in many mining operations is that they, they, they switch or they change completely their mining plan in the sense of their started to delay uh, sustaining CapEx expenditures. Uh, so they starting to delay the stripping of new faces of the mine and starting to delay uh, larger maintenance uh, uh, because of all of that required too many people. Uh, so having all of that in mind, it helped to get production up now, but probably will have an impact in the next two to three years in the sense that uh, uh, they did a lot of high grading as well. So basically speed up the high grade to take advantage now, but that will have a, a negative impact on the, uh, on, the, on the short term, let's say in the two, three years. So one risk that we're seeing is that by delaying all of these expenditures today, may potentially some copper mining operations will start to see that effect in a couple of years time. And that will mean either increasing their costs or uh, having to decrease their production guidelines. So that's, that's one risk that we see really, really short term. Um, on the, if we're talking copper, obviously in the geopolitical side, we need to talk a little bit about Chile and Peru, uh, particularly in Chile. Uh, so this um, coming uh, on the, uh, by the end of October, there will be a referendum about changing or not the constitution. So this is sort of the, the culmination of almost a year of uh, social distress and uh, riots and other things uh, that we started to see last year where uh, people are demanding more, let's say, social benefits in a way, so healthcare, education, uh, pensions, etc. And uh, for some reason, that, that discussion switched towards changing or not the constitution. So basically, the referendum that we are voting uh, next week, it's about changing or not the constitution, which uh, how that would actually translate into a real change, I think, is yet to be seen. Um, and, and, and we'll see that result soon, but definitely that's been the main topic of discussion around uh, in Chile, the geopolitical situation. But having said all that, how that really translates into mining, because that can have, I think, either way it goes, there will be a change, particularly in the, uh, on the fiscal expenditure, because uh, either whatever um, side wins, uh, necessarily, there will have to be a change, I think, in the fiscal expenditures for the years to come uh, to improve pensions, healthcare, education, etc. So that means that uh, that money will have to come from somewhere, and that somewhere being uh, uh, mining the the most relevant industrial activity in Chile will potentially come one way or another from mining. So you can see that as two ways. On one hand, it's positive because that will mean the government will promote and try to get more investment for new projects, new mines, so maybe fast-tracking permits and things like that. Uh, that's one view. Or the other view also can be, okay, instead of bringing more investment, it will be uh, maybe increasing taxes or royalties or something like that, which haven't really yet been in the discussion, but if uh, the approval wins and maybe it approves to change the constitution, we'll probably enter in a two-year sort of period where how the change is going to be actually be, be done and what will be the ultimate impact. And one thing can be, okay, we'll fast track investment or another one would be, okay, we'll increase the taxation base from the mining activity because we need to fund uh, the new uh, social benefits that are going to be improved. Uh, so, or maybe it will be a mix of both. 
So definitely uh, something to pay to pay attention to. Um, but uh, having said all that, I mean, I, I might be a bit biased because I'm, <laughs> I'm from Chile, but uh, uh, having said all that, still, uh, it's not that easy to build a project or a mining operation, a major mining operation from scratch in a country that doesn't have the infrastructure, uh, the, the, the institutions in place to actually make that happen. Obviously, uh, Robert Friedland is sort of changing that paradigm probably with the Ivanhoe and uh, their huge development in, in DRC. So obviously it's, it's a always changing world. So maybe we'll start to see how other jurisdiction might improve and maybe some of like Chile will deteriorate. Uh, obviously that will not be a one year, something that will happen over one year or two years. It's probably going to be a couple of decades, but definitely something to pay attention to. And similarly in Peru as well, where some of the, there were some political issues uh, the, the president was about to be impeached in a way. Uh, it's not exactly the same concept, but similarly, uh, some months ago, uh, <clears throat> there will be a new election coming uh, next year, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, um, definitely as well, I think both Peru and Chile see mining as a, as a key industrial activity, and it will help to recover from this uh, coronavirus crisis. Uh, however, how that will actually translate into uh, a speed up investment and speed up projects, I think is yet to be seen. One of the major issues with Peru has been the anti-mining sort of sentiment in communities in the around Las Bambas and that, that mining corridor, uh, which obviously has been pretty critical. And if you go into the exploration side, uh, the, the bureaucracy to actually get a, a drilling permit, it's quite a... Uh, it's quite a downturn for any exploration junior that wants to, to, to do any sort of investment and, and exploration activities there. So I think those are a couple of things that if Peru, for instance, wants to improve the and, and, and favor investment there, they will have to do something related to that. And hopefully we see that and we see that this uh, coronavirus crisis and the, the economic recession as a result of it will, will result in a more in favoring mining investment. But again, you know, it's it's, Anything can happen, and like I said, it can go the other way around if we if we decide to go for a more of a taxation type of uh, approach, which I think uh, will not necessarily be uh, effective in bringing new investment. But again, everything has to be balanced out, and uh, and and those are a couple key issues maybe that I think are worthwhile mentioning. Yeah, fantastic, definitely uh, key considerations there. Okay, well, that brings us around to time. Uh, and I'd just like to say thank you very much, Francisco, for a very comprehensive uh, rundown of the copper market at the moment. So thank you very much for participating in One to One Mining Investment Americas. No, no, thanks. Thanks to you. And uh, always happy to participate here. And it's good to see that uh, there is quite a, a better mood, I will say, across the investment community. So um, I'm so again, thanks for being here. And uh, I will put my contact information there. So do a little bit of a marketing if that's okay. So uh, any other further questions, please don't hesitate in, in reaching out, uh, writing an email or, or giving a, a phone call.